schools, so we never had art classes, and I was always the, the artist in my class. There were uh, like maybe 15 or 20 other kids, so it wasn't very hard. So I, I was very lucky in a way, and I never had to wonder if I was good enough. I always thought, like, you're either an artist like me or you're something else, like all the other kids in my class. And so I had very good confidence because of that. Um, I never took art classes. I just, I just drew all day in the margins of my work. And, and then I had a crisis when I was maybe 16 and thinking about college. Um, I realized that you, you, don't, you can't have a career just from drawing things. You have to call yourself something. You call yourself a comics artist or a fine artist or, or a cartoonist or an illustrator. And they all seemed kind of alien to me, and I thought hard about it, and I thought I'll be a cartoonist and a comics artist. And I, I started drawing, it was very hard. I started drawing cartoons and comics, and nothing felt, I, I didn't feel like I was expressing myself the way I did when I just drew, drew in the margins of my work at school. But I was working on it, and when it came time to apply for colleges, I, I made a portfolio, and I went I went in to the school I wanted to go to, Cooper Union, because it was a free art it was the only free art school. I went um I went there a year before I really needed to apply, and I brought my portfolio of cartoons and comics, and they didn't even look at my work. They said we don't take cartoonists or comics artists here. So I went home and I thought, I guess I'm, I'm highbrow now. And I started painting and I started going to museums and I decided to be Cezanne. And, and I, I got in the next year with, with a portfolio of, of like eight 19th century paintings. And it messed me up a little bit. Well, when I started doing that, I also thought that I stopped loving art. I thought, I'm going to make art and I'll get my degree in it, but what I really want to be is a writer. And so during college, I, I took all the art classes and I snuck away to writing classes in a different college and I spent all of my time writing. And then gradually I started illustrating what I wrote and then after college I realized what I was really making were comics. I, um, I started liking, The New Yorker's been in my family for a long time. It's, it's the upper middle highbrow thing to read. And if you're a certain kind of person, like my mom, as opposed to my dad, you worship The New Yorker. And if you're another kind of person, maybe like my dad, maybe you prefer, you prefer to um, take hikes or something. But um, I decided I was like my mom, and we started getting the New Yorker when I was 14, when my mom stopped being so cheap that she, she finally subscribed to it. And, and it was, that was the year, I think, I think I was 14, was the year Saul Steinberg died. He was a great illustrator. He did a lot of covers, and he, he did cartoons sometimes, but he was mostly something else. And, and that was when I realized I wanted to do this. And a couple of years later, I fell in love with Roz Chast, who was a New Yorker cartoonist, who's, who's the, maybe the only weird New Yorker cartoonist. She's still my favorite. And so every couple of years, I would get together the courage to make maybe 10, 10 or 20 cartoons and I would, I would bring them to the New Yorker and they would be rejected and I would be crestfallen and then I would try again two years later and maybe four years ago I, I came and tried again and, and the, the, meet, the cartoon meeting was very big that time. It's usually, it was usually maybe five five real professional cartoonists who are all men in their 80s and 90s. But this time it was like a hundred people, all different kinds of people. And, and I felt much more welcomed. And there was a film crew and the editor, Bob Mankoff, is very happy when he's on camera. So he was very nice to me and encouraging. And that was what I needed. And I kept submitting after that.
it intercepts a lot of different uh, issues. So do tell us something about this bintel, brief, love and longing in old New York. A, a bintel brief is the name of a very popular Yiddish advice column that ran in the early 1900s in a socialist Yiddish newspaper that was for brand new immigrants who had just come to New York from Eastern Europe. Um, I hadn't heard of it. It was, I, I came to it in kind of a funny way. After college, I was just starting to write comics. I had a Fulbright grant in Brussels, and, and I hadn't finished the book that I went there to make. I, I hadn't, I'd worked very hard, but I hadn't made anything at all. So I was trying to apply for different grants in order to have money to support myself while I worked on something, but but more than that, I, I wanted the support of people believing in me and, and, and when you're not sure what you're doing, a grant application is a good way to force yourself to put it into words that other people will understand. So I hadn't wanted to make this particular book. I only made it because a grant I found that seemed promising was, was a grant for young Jewish artists. Which, which isn't a good way to start, but, but I, think, I think that if I had chosen a book I, I would have wanted to make, it would have been something kind of vague and internal, which is how I tend to think. And I don't think I would have made it, I think it would have been too ambitious for, for a 24 year old who was just starting to make comics. And, and this was, this is concrete. So I, I did fall in love with the project when I read some of the letters to this advice column. I, I wasn't expecting to. I was very, I loved poetry back then and these scenes, and, and I was running from Judaism, which was the suburban life that, um, that I had growing up where I hadn't quite fit in. So, so it surprised me I, I love the letters because they're all from these people who were who were total outsiders in New York and the letters were so vivid and and their troubles were so immediate and and they just I, I just I just really love them. Tell us something. This story began for me. Oh I, I will that's it. it. I'll read it. Um, this story began for me on a visit to my grandparents' apartment when I was a kid. My grandparents kept their home very neat. The only worn out thing they owned was an old yellow notebook I found on a shelf that day. I had time to notice that it was pasted full of newspaper clippings in a foreign language before something very unusual happened. So this is the first page of the book. The book consists of 11 stories, each based on a different letter that I either took from the translated book or had translated myself from, from the old Yiddish letters. And, and when I finished those stories, I realized that I needed to tie them together somehow. So I made, I made this story about, that's, that's in a much simpler style than, than the stories, about me as a little girl finding this one, this one old and Jewish thing in my grandparents' very American, very bland and neat apartment and being curious about it and opening it up and out comes the ghost of Abraham Kahan, the, the founding editor of the, the, the newspaper, The Forward, and you'll see that later um, I, I get really scared and I put it back and I don't think about it again, but then many, many years later when, I'm, when I move out of my parents' house and I'm living in New York City, my grandma sends me this notebook as a present without any explanation. And and it turns out that, that the stories come from Abraham Kahan coming out of the notebook and first being really angry that I don't speak Yiddish and don't have a Jewish culture anymore and forcing me to listen to these stories and later I'm the one begging him to read me the stories. Which is a metaphor for how, how Jewish people in my generation, we, we aren't really tied to our past as much as we'd like to be. We don't, we don't speak Yiddish anymore. And um, 
we don't belong to completely Jewish com communities. We have all kinds of friends, which is because America is so good to us and, and doesn't force us only to spend time with each other anymore. But we still, we, it's not like we're, our, maybe our parents' generation rebelled against their very Jewish parents by becoming more American, but we're not rebelling. We just don't know how to hold on to it anymore. And there's really no answer. And then this is another, um, this is a different story in the book. It's, it's by a man named Yechiel Schlachberg, who lives in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, he's writing because his, this is really this, the saddest letter I've read. It's just like full of survivor's guilt. He, he's, he survived a pogrom that his family was in and some people were killed and his father was badly wounded and, and their house was destroyed and he, I think he was out of the house at the time so he got out unscathed and he didn't return and he just ran and he made his way to America. And he's been in touch with his sisters and, and he's trying to bring them over to America. But they all realize that their father is too old to come with them. He'll, he'll never learn to fit in outside of his home. And meanwhile, he has this terrible wound. And, and so Yechiel is asking what his sisters should do. Should they spend the money that Yechiel is able to give them on setting up a new house in Eastern Europe where their dad can be a little more comfortable or should they just abandon him and come to New York? And this is the only one I drew completely on the computer. I was trying to mimic a wood, a wood block print style. Just, I was thinking of German expressionist prints that are so strangled and so sad. This is a, another letter. This one is, um, this is the most dramatic and funny one. I think someone probably made it up. It's by, it's by a barber who um, had a dream that he was cutting someone's throat and now he doesn't know if he can still be a barber or if he's going to do this in real life. <laughs> Should, oh, this is the yeah. dream, I guess. Yeah, this, this is more of it. This is um, the next page of this one. It, yeah, he has a dream that he's cutting God's beard, um, and uh, it, it's this letter. All the letters are really about this this strange tension between having had a whole life, including like very close family and community and rabbi and religion back home, and now being in New York without any of this and. They're, they're not even religious anymore, so they all have this guilt about leaving their God and things like that. So um, he was cutting God's hair. He comes back down because his boss calls him. It turns out they have a very important client. It's George Washington. And George Washington ends up making fun of the guy who's dreaming, and that's why he slits his throat. I was wondering, Liana, how much of Liana is in here? Or, I mean, how much you add to the, the actual letters? So, there was the dream in that letter, but yeah. how detailed was it? And how you kind of started off from there and, and amplified the idea? So, how, how much is in there of, of, of your own uh, invention? I added, I added a lot in the pictures, but I added very little in the words. In the words, I mostly took things away because a lot of the letters were very rambling and it, it just wouldn't work for comics. Right. And do, do you begin with images or with, I mean, you started off with words yeah. because you had letters. Yeah, right. and, and then you, you picked some, some sentences that, that were crucial and important and relevant for the story and then then you, you created images starting from those sentences sentences you picked. How, how, how did it actually work? I, I work very intuitively, which is a bad thing in a comics artist, I think. I started with, in, with words, I, I blocked it out, I drew maybe a grid of boxes and I put the words in the grid. And if you read the book, you'll see that some of the stories are, are 
bad, and those ones are the ones that I just did that with, and, and I didn't have months and months to keep going back and changing them. But but the way I like to work is to to act like a I don't know, to act like something between um, an artist and a factory. I keep I'll, I'll like be a factory and I'll be like, okay, I'm chopping up this thing that I've written and I'm putting it in boxes and I'm going to illustrate it very literally. And then I take a step back and I think, no, this isn't good at all. I have to, I have to go start from the deep. I don't, I don't, I can't really explain how I work. This, this, I, I, I was hoping that it would turn out that this was harder than how it usually will be because I, I was adapting something and not telling my own story, but my next book is has been very difficult also. So I, I think that's just how I work. I start with a lot, I polish it down and polish it down and polish it down until it's essential and then I redo it. So, I mean, so generous with, with what she does. So, thank you so much. 